Okay, so whether we're talking about pandan or bananas or beans or toast, uh, all of these foods have one thing in common. They have many things in common, but one of them is fiber. And fiber is an extremely important uh, component. I'm not going to refer to it as a macronutrient, but an important component of food, especially uh, in a whole food plant-based diet. You refer to fiber as being the most important lever of health. So when you said that, I thought it was very interesting. Can you give us a little insight into what impact fiber has on one's physiology? And uh, you know what does it do from a mechanistic point of view? And why is it something that you consider to be so important in a whole food diet? Right. So the reason I call it the single uh, most important lever, uh, we'll talk about the benefits in a minute. It's because it's something that you can add to your to your diet. It's not something you have to remove. It does, you don't have to restrict yourself, uh, deprive yourself of something or do something very difficult. Fiber can easily be added to your food. Um, so in terms of all the levers you could have, you know, so if you could sleep eight hours, if you could move an hour a day, if you could, uh, if you could restrict your calories, all of those are difficult, but adding fiber is easy. So in terms of something that everyone can do, unless you have Crohn's disease or you have a specific disease where you don't, um, you have a condition where you don't want to add with, you know, where adding fiber may complicate the situation for you. Um, adding fiber is an easy thing that everyone can do to improve their health. Now, what does fiber actually do? So let's first talk about like, what is fiber? So fiber is a non-digestible carbohydrate. So it doesn't break down into glucose in your body. And it's found, it's a nutrient, it's basically found in nutrient-dense foods like veggies, fruits, legumes, and whole grains. And it travels through the gastrointestinal tract and becomes food for your gut microbiome, actually. So it's not food for you, it's food for your gut. So when you consume fiber, that fiber ferments uh, in your gut and it produces byproducts that really promote um, well-being. And I can describe some of those things. So some of, some of the byproducts that it's producing are what's called short-chain short fatty acids. And these are essentially signaling molecules that interact with the intestinal microbiome to increase production of a number of key metabolites that help steady your blood glucose. They regulate your hunger and they reduce inflammation, uh, which all of them are really important for diabetes management. So um, let's also talk about, before we go into the, into the benefits, talk about also um, soluble fiber versus insoluble fiber. So you hear, like, what's soluble fiber? That's something you put, you know, generally when we talk about fiber, we talk about solubility, viscosity, you know, fermentality and all that. But in terms of a soluble fiber is something you generally pour, you know, maybe you put it in the water, you, you mix it and you drink it. It generally turns into gel-like consistency when it's mixed with liquid and it helps reduce spikes in blood glucose levels, um, keeps you, you know, full and it helps in kind of nutrient absorption. Insoluble fiber would be something that would just basically goes through your body without getting processed. You know, it just comes out the other end um, pretty much mostly intact and it uses its kind of uh, its role is to kind of push out on weight, on unwanted waste. So, what does fiber do for us? Um, well, it does several things. One, uh, I mentioned it stabilizes blood sugar. We can talk about how it does that. It um, plays a role in gut health. It helps. It's anti-inflammatory and it helps you manage your weight. So, let's start from the top. Um, blood glucose. So what, how does that work? Well, when you eat kind of high fiber foods, basically um, what happens is that um, fiber slows down the rate at which your body is breaking down food into glucose. Um, so when you eat um, high fiber foods, you don't spike, if you want to use that word. Um, uh, Cyrus, you don't spike your blood sugar as much as a low fiber food. Let's say just the, a, a carbohydrate, like you're eating, um, let's say, uh, I don't want to call it cake is sort of, it depends. Cake is 
<laughs> it depends. Cake can or cannot be um, good depending on what, what's in it. But generally, we think of fast um, carbohydrates like a lot of packaged foods as things that just go through your body really fast. But the, sure, let's, the let's more... refer to those as, as refined carbohydrates because that's the way yes, that we refer exactly. to them because packaging process. There you exactly. Go. Perfect. So refined carbohydrates are just going to run through your body and spike you like crazy, right? So, but high fiber foods, really high fiber foods, um, for example, you know, green veggies, kale, collards, broccoli, you know, your Brussels sprouts, bananas, pears, apples, oranges, grapefruit, you know, berries, beans and legumes like lentils, kidneys, pinto, black, navy beans, quinoa, farro, um, other grains like oats, barley, um, yeah, any kind of whole grain. You know, root vegetables like carrots, beets, sweet potatoes, chia seeds, garlic, these things basically move, um, you know, help your help, help you um, sort of slow down your um, your digestion so that you don't um, you don't get these big spikes. So that's that's one of the one of the one of the things that happens. It slows down the rate at which your body is essentially breaking down food into glucose. So that's one of the one okay. of the she, yeah. That's actually this is actually a great opportunity to um, talk about what do you define as a spike at January.ai? What, what's happening in the research? Like, let's talk about this this term spike. Okay, sure. Yeah. So basically, um, spike is uh, so generally you hear in literature it's referred to as glycemic dysregulation or glycemic variation which means like your blood glucose basically goes up. And then for a healthy person, when you eat something or when you do very intense exercise, you will get a spike. When you think hard, if you're under stress, you may get a spike. For a healthy person, this blood glucose goes up and through the mechanism um, with insulin, we can talk about basically insulin is a hormone that helps your cells take up glucose and the level of insulin and glucose needs to be balanced in your body for this to go up and come down at a beautiful rate. When they're out of balance, you may end up either because you're producing insulin too slowly or you don't produce insulin at all if you're like a type 1 uh, person or you could have a type 2 person who is um, a, a slow in producer of insulin, for example. Um, you may not have enough insulin to, um, to essentially help your cells take up all the glucose that you've produced or you just have excessive glucose because you're just um, of the things that you might be eating. But for whatever reason, you have this excessive glucose sitting in your blood sugar. Um, and you, you know, and for people that are dysregulated, this can sort of stay up and like not go down very nicely and very quickly. So what's the problem with the spike? I'm curious, how high, how high would that number have to be Generally, like to be considered? Yeah, for people with diabetes, generally that number is um, 180. So it's uh, you want to keep your blood glucose level between 70 and 180 for people with diabetes, with type 2 diabetes. For people that are pre-diabetes, generally we think of as trying to keep it between 70 and 140. Maybe for healthy people, really it could be anything. So first of all, let me tell you, there's no such a thing as like you must keep it to 110 or 120 or 140. For healthy people and for people with prediabetes and diabetes, generally you want to keep that under 180. Um, but it's thought that it would be nice for people with prediabetes to try to maintain, maintain that around 140. Um, now, some people may want to stay there. Some people are setting crazy limits for themselves. And uh, especially when sometimes they're using uh, continuous glucose uh, monitors, they're getting really freaked out about their glucose and they're saying, oh my God, like, I'm going to set it at 100. I'm never going to eat again. I don't want to eat anything. Go ahead, Cyrus. Yeah, so something. I'm actually glad that you bring this up because um, what you're hinting at here is that in the, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the research, there doesn't seem to be a consensus on what a blood glucose spike is considered to be because even in the world of type 1 diabetes, they, they say that the range of acceptable blood glucose goes from 70 to 180. If you ask me, I think 180 is too high, right? I think 180 is too high. I think it should be probably a little closer to 160, maybe closer to 150. Why? Well, I don't have any research-backed evidence-based data to demonstrate that um, that is going to lead to a better outcome over the course of many years. But I have type 1 diabetes. I've been living with it for 20 years. And I can tell you there's a fundamental difference between a 150 and a 180, right? But what you're saying is that in the research, regardless of whether you're looking at prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, 
it's it's kind of confusing. Am I mistaken? Uh, no, that's that's correct. But I think some companies are using a low uh, glucose level as a uh, weight loss lever. Uh, so they're kind of telling people, hey, keep your glucose down to a certain level, like 100 or 110, forcing them to lose weight, to, to eat this essentially low-carb foods in order for them to lose weight. And then they're figuring that if somebody, if somebody uses my product and my product causes them to lose weight, they're going to love my product. But that's not necessarily getting you healthy. So I think that those are some of the dangers of, um, because what happens? So it, you can avoid uh, getting a spike potentially by eating a lot of fatty foods um, and not eating high fiber foods that might, um, might spike your sugar a little bit um, and, and show you that curve and, and essentially living on fats, several problems, A, you don't have a spike, but you can eat, you know, as we talked um, earlier, we can talk, you know, you can eat five avocados and three coconuts and not get a spike. You're still going to get fat and you're going to get, I don't mean fat physically, like visually, but I mean that that fat is entering your body. You're actually going to potentially uh, gain weight. And that is not good for your health. It is not good for your health to have a lot of saturated uh, fat in your body, and we know that weight gain is bad for all your markers. Um, but to focus singularly, well, is it bad if you get on a bike and you you exercise for two hours, you're going to get a huge spike. Is that bad? No, that's a good spike. Um, that's a great spike to have. Um, is it a bad spike if you eat a banana? No, you're fine. You're eating fiber. It is a good idea to combine some of your uh, fruits and vegetables with potentially some of the healthy nut butters and some of the healthy fats out there or some of your, um, some of your vegetables with, with healthy fats like avocado. But do you want to strictly eat fats as a way? Is that a healthy diet? Absolutely, utterly, absolutely no, it is not. You want to eat a, 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 a diet high in fiber um, and you want to eat obviously a balanced diet. But should you chase spikes? I totally disagree. I do not think you should chase spikes. I think that you should be aware that you should be more focused on how fast your glucose is going up, how fast it's coming down. You should be more focused about that. You should be focused about whether you are metabolically healthy, meaning when you have a spike, how fast is it coming down? Um, and also uh, making sure you're not getting uh, you know, making sure that you kind of experiment with your body and learn kind of um, how your body works so that you can try to minimize uh, the really very high spikes, as you said, Cyrus, 150s or, or whatever, try to limit those. Um, but no, do I think that all spikes are bad? Absolutely not. Um, is that what we should be focused on? No. Should we absolutely restrict ourselves to a very low spike? like 110 or 120, force ourselves to do that? Absolutely not. That makes no sense. I love what you're saying here because you're, you're focusing on the long-term impact here. And without saying it, you're, you're really highlighting the fact that you're asking people to do behaviors that improve their insulin sensitivity rather than some short-term adjustment that can flatten the curve on a CGM, which is missing the bigger picture. So it's, it's great correct. to hear that. Yes, 100%. Yes, yeah. exactly what I'm saying. Your entire focus should be on your long-term health. I mean, people can lose weight quickly. Losing weight, you know, is associated with like an event or something you want to do. Weight maintenance is extremely hard. If you want to do weight maintenance, you need to adopt these habits uh, like having daily amount of fiber that is appropriate for you uh, and other things like intermittent fasting. But fiber um, plays a huge role in, like we said, how your body turns, um, you know, breaks down glucose and it can slow down the process that your body goes through to break down glucose. So it can actually balance your blood sugar. It's really, really good for that. It also, uh, like I said, um, fiber is food for your gut microbiome actually. Um, so, um, it, uh, restores your gut, um, microbiome and when your gut is healthier, um, your, you are healthier. And 
it also has is anti-inflammatory. You know, um, chronic low-grade inflammation is one of the most common paths to progressive diabetes. It's it's um, you know related to insulin resistance as well. So something like seventy to eighty percent of your immune system lies behind the the thin barrier behind your gut. So so much is happening in in your gut. So if you want to lower inflammation, you also want to have these fibrous foods because um, you want to maintain a strong intestinal barrier, basically, um, and, you know, induce kind of the production of the protective mucus and regulate your glucose. And of course, when you're eating fiber, uh, a lot of fiber, you uh, feel full. So you have, it has a lot of um, uh, impact on your satiety level. Uh, It reduces your sugar cravings. Um, It moves you know, um, like I said, slowly and making you feel that you're fuller for longer. It's also, you know, fiber is found in nutrient dense foods. So, you know, that combined with exercise is going to get you more energy and hopefully you won't feel so hungry and you will have calorie deficit and hopefully, um, you know, weight loss is also, it, it helps with weight loss, which can also help you with a lot of other clinical markers. It sounds like fiber from Whole Foods is a wind-finity situation. Just nothing but great I things I can't say enough here. about that. I can't say enough about that. You, you, it's the easiest thing you can do to get healthy. The easiest thing you can do I is to, to, to increase fiber in your diet. And how much fiber should you have? Um, well, you know, a, a healthy adult um, female, 21 to 25 grams a day male, uh, 30 to 38 grams a day, but Americans are getting about, you know, 10 to 15 grams a day. So it's really, really critical to increase fiber. And how do you know where to find for it? Well, anyone who's having refined, uh, what did you call them? You called them um, refined carbohydrates. Refined carbohydrates. <laughs> all the folks that are eating a lot of packaged foods, look for dietary fiber as a very critical number on that food label. Look for that and see how much fiber foods have. Uh, seek out foods that are high fiber. But the best thing, of course, is to eat fresh foods, you know, just produce the way it came out of the ground or it came out of the, you know, off the tree. Um, That's the most, that's the best way to eat fiber. But sometimes we can't get, you know, uh, all the fiber that we need directly from, from our food. Not everyone can eat all the fruits and vegetables that they want, in which case it's important to take, you know, to watch other fiber food you're eating in your packaged foods or get a fiber supplement if that's what it comes down to. But it's important to add fiber.